Chapter 3, The Courtship Four of them met in the great council room of the castle. Prince Humperdinck, his confidant Count Rugen, his father, aging King Lotharon, and Queen Bella, his evil stepmother. Queen Bella was shaped like a gumdrop and colored like a raspberry. She was easily the most beloved person in the kingdom and had been married to the king long before he began mumbling. Prince Humperdinck was but a child then, and since the only stepmothers he knew were the evil ones from the stories, he always called Bella that, or E.S. for short. All right, the prince began when they were all assembled. Who do I marry? Let's pick a bride and get it done. Aging King Lotharon said, I've been thinking it's really getting to be about time for Humperdinck to pick a bride. He didn't actually so much say that as mumble it. I've been mumble, mumble, humble, mumble, ding, dum, bell. Queen Bella was the only one who bothered ferreting out his meanings any more. You couldn't be right, dear, she said and patted his royal robes. What did he say? He said whoever we decided on would be getting a thunderously handsome prince for a lifetime companion. Tell him he's looking quite well himself, the prince returned. We've only just changed miracle men, the queen said. That accounts for the improvement. You mean you fired Miracle Max, Prince Humperdinck said. I thought he was the only one left. Oh, no, we found another one up in the mountains, and he's quite extraordinary. Old, of course, but then who wants a young miracle man? Tell him I've changed miracle men, King Lotharon said. It came out, What did he say? the prince wondered. He said a man of your importance can't marry just any princess. A uh, true, true, Prince Humperdinck said. He sighed deeply. <sighs> I suppose that means Norina. That would certainly be a perfect match politically, Count Rugen said. Prince Norina was from Gilder, the country that lay just across the Florin Channel. In Gilder, they put it differently. For them, Florin was the country on the other side of the Channel of Gilder. In any case, the two countries had stayed alive over the centuries, mainly by warring each other. There had been the Olive War, the tuna fish discrepancy, which almost bankrupted both nations, the Roman Rift, which did send them both into insolvency, only to be followed by the Discord of the Emeralds, in which they both got rich again, chiefly by banding together for a brief period and robbing everybody within sailing distance. I wonder if she hunts, though, said Humperdinck. I don't care so much about personality, just so long as they're good with a knife. I saw her several years ago, Queen Bella said. She seemed lovely, though hardly muscular. I would describe her more as a knitter than a doer, but again, lovely. Skin? asked the prince. Marbleish, answered the queen. Lips? Number or color? said the queen. Color, E.S. Rosish. Cheeks the same, eyes largish, one blue, one green. Hmm, and form? Hourglassish, always clothed divinely, and of course famous throughout Gilder for the largest hat collection in the world. Well, let's bring her over here for some state occasion and have a look at her, said the prince. Isn't there a princess in Gilder that would be about the right age, said the aging king. It came out. Mumsy's gamble a bumble murmur. Are you never wrong, said Queen Bella, and she smiled into the weakening eyes of her ruler. What did he say, said the prince? That I should leave this very day with an invitation, replied the queen. So began the great visit of Princess Norina. Uh, me again. Of all the cuts in this section, I feel most justified in making this one. Just as the chapters on Wailing and Moby Dick can be omitted by all but the most punishment-loving readers, so the packing scenes that Morgenstern details here are really best left alone. That's what happens for the next 56 and a half pages of The Princess Bride. Packing. I include the unpacking scenes in the same category. What happens is just this. Queen Bella packs most of her wardrobe, 11 pages, and travels to Gilder, 2 pages. In Gilder, she unpacks 5 pages and then tenders the invitation to Princess Norina, 1 page. Princess Norina accepts 1 page, then Princess Norina packs all her clothes and hats, 
23 pages. And together, the princess and the queen travel back to Florin for the annual celebration of the founding of Florin City, one page. They reach the King Lotharin's castle, where Princess Narina is shown her quarters, one half page, and unpacks all the same clothes and hats we've just seen her pack one and a half pages before, twelve pages. It's a baffling passage. I spoke to Professor Bongiorno of Columbia University, the head of their Florinese department, and he said this was the most deliciously satiric chapter in the entire book. Morgenstern's point, apparently, being simply to show that although Florin considers itself vastly more civilized than Gilder, Gilder was in fact the far more sophisticated country, as indicated by their superiority in number and quality of ladies' clothes. I'm not about to argue with the full professor, but if you ever have a really unbearable case of insomnia, do yourself a favor and start reading chapter 3 of the uncut version. Anyway, things pick up a bit once the prince and princess meet and spend the day. Norina did have, as advertised, marbleish skin, rosish lips and cheeks, largish eyes, one blue, one green, an hourglassish form, and easily the most extraordinary collection of hats ever assembled. Wide-brimmed and narrow, some tall, some not, some fancy, some colorful, some plaid, some plain. She doted on changing hats at every opportunity. When she met the prince, she was wearing one hat. When he asked her for a stroll, she excused herself shortly to return wearing another, equally flattering. Things went on like this throughout the day, but it seems to me to be a bit too much of court etiquette for modern readers, so it's not until the evening meal that I return to the original text. Dinner was held in the great hall of Lotharin's castle. Ordinarily, they would all have supped in the dining room, but for an event of this importance, that place was simply too small. So tables were placed end to end along the center of the great hall, an enormously drafty spot that was given to being chilly even in the summertime. There were many doors and giant entranceways, and wind gusts sometimes reached gale force. This night was more typical than less. The wind whistled constantly, and the candles constantly needed relighting, and some of the more daringly dressed ladies shivered. But Prince Humperdinck didn't seem to mind, and in Florin, if he didn't, you didn't either. At 8.23, there seemed every chance of a lasting alliance starting between Florin and Gilder. At 8.24, the nations were very close to war. What happened was simply this. At 8.23 and 5 seconds, the main course of the evening was ready for serving. The main course was essence of brandied pig, and needed a lot to serve 500 people. So in order to hasten the serving, a giant double door that led from the kitchen to the great hall was opened. The giant double door was on the north end of the room. The door remained open throughout what followed. The proper wine for essence of brandied pig was in readiness behind the double door that eventually led to the wine cellar. The double door was opened at 8.23 and 10 seconds in order that the dozen wine stewards could get their kegs quickly to the eaters. The double door, it might be noted, was at the south end of the room. At this point, an unusually strong crosswind was clearly evident. Prince Humperdinck did not notice because at that moment he was whispering with the Princess Norina of Gilder. He was cheek to cheek with her, his head under her wide-brimmed blue-green hat, which brought out the exquisite color in both her largish eyes. At 8.23 and 20 seconds, King Lotharin made his somewhat belated appearance to dinner. He was always belated now, had been for years, and in the past people had been known to starve before he got there. But of late, meals just began without him, which was fine with him, since his new miracle man had taken him off meals anyway. The king entered through the king's door, a huge hinged thing that only he was allowed to use. It took several servants in excellent condition to work it. It should be reported that the king's door was always in the east side of any room, since the king was, of all people, closest to the sun. What happened then has been variously described as a norther or a sou'wester, depending on where you were seated in the room when it struck, but all hands agree on one thing. At 8.23 and 25 seconds, it was pretty gusty in the great hall. Most of the candles lost their flames and toppled, which was only important because a few of them fell, still burning into the small kerosene cups that were placed here and there across the banquet table so that the essence of brandied pig could be properly flaming when served. 
Servants rushed in from all over to put out the flames, and they did a good enough job, considering that everything in the room was flying this way, that way, fans, scarves, and hats, particularly the hat of Princess Norina. It flew off to the wall behind her where she quickly retrieved it and put it properly on. That was at 8.23 and 50 seconds. It was too late. At 8.23.55, Prince Humperdinck rose roaring, the veins in his thick neck etched like hemp. There were still flames in some places, and their redness reddened his already blood-red face. He looked as he stood there like a barrel on fire. He then said to the Princess Norina of Gilder the five words that brought the nations to the brink. Madam, feel free to flee. And with that, he stormed from the Great Hall. The time then was 8.24. Prince Humperdinck made his angry way to the balcony above the Great Hall and stared down at the chaos. The fires were still in places flaming red. Guests were pouring out through the doors, and Princess Norina, hatted and faint, was being carried by her servants far from view. Queen Bella finally caught up with the prince, who stormed along the balcony, clearly not yet in control. "'I do wish you hadn't been quite so blunt,' Queen Bella said. The prince whirled on her. "'I'm not marrying any bald princess, and that's that.' "'No one would know,' Queen Bella explained. "'She has hats even for sleeping.' "'I would know,' cried the prince. "'Did you see the candlelight reflecting off her skull?' "'But things would have been so good with Gilder,' the queen said, "'addressing herself half to the prince, half to Count Rugen, who had now joined them. "'Forget about Gilder. I'll conquer it sometime. "'I've been wanting to ever since I was a kid anyway,' he approached the queen. "'People snicker behind your back when you've got a bald wife. "'And I can do without that, thank you very much. "'You'll just have to find someone else.' "'Who? Find me somebody. She should just look nice, is all.' "'That Narina has no hair,' King Lutheran said, puffing up to the others. "'Thank you for pointing that out, dear,' said Queen Bella. "'I don't think Humperdinck will like that,' said the king. "'Dumble, humble, mumble.' Then Count Rugen stepped forward. "'You want someone who looks nice, but what if she's a commoner?' "'A commoner the better,' Prince Humperdinck replied, pacing again. "'What if she can't hunt?' the count went on. "'I don't care if she can't spell,' the prince said. Suddenly he stopped and faced them all. I'll tell you what I want, he began. I want someone who is so beautiful that when you see her you say, Wow, that Huppeding must be some kind of fellow to have a wife like that. Search the country, search the world, just find her. Count Rugen could only smile. She is already found, he said. It was dawn when the two horsemen reined in at the hilltop. Count Rugen rode a splendid black horse, large, perfect, powerful. The prince rode one of his whites. It made Rugen's mount seem like a plow puller. She delivers milk in the mornings, Count Rugen said. And she is truly, without question, no possibility of air beautiful. She was something of a mess when I saw her, the Count admitted, but the potential was overwhelming. A milkmaid, the prince ran the words across his rough tongue. I don't know that I could wed one of them even under the best of conditions. People might snicker that she was the best I could do. True, the Count admitted. If you prefer, we can ride back to Florin City without waiting. Ah, we've come this far, the Prince said. We might as well we- His voice quite simply died. I'll take her, he managed finally as Buttercup rode slowly by below them. No one will snicker, I think, the Count said. I must court her now, said the prince. Leave us alone for a minute, he rode the white expertly down the hill. Buttercup had never seen such a giant beast or such a rider. I am your prince and you will marry me, Humperdinck said. Buttercup whispered, I am your servant and I refuse. I am your prince and you cannot refuse me. I am your loyal servant and I just did. Refusal means death. Kill me then. I am your prince, and I am not that bad. How could you rather be dead than married to me? 
Because, Buttercup said, marriage involves love, and that is not a pastime at which I excel. I tried once, and it went badly, and I am sworn to never love another. Love, said Prince Humperdinck. Who mentioned love? Not me, I can tell you. Look, there must always be a male heir to the throne of Florin. That's me. Once my father dies, there won't be an heir, just a king. That's me again. When that happens, I'll marry and have children until there is a son. So you can either marry me and be the richest and most powerful woman in a thousand miles and give turkeys away at Christmas and provide me a son, or you can die in terrible pain in the very near future. Make up your own mind. I'll never love you. Ha! I wouldn't want it if I had it. Then by all means, let's marry. <laughs>